My name is Adam Duxter. I am a local news reporter. And in the summer of 2021, I was working as a multimedia journalist for WISC News 3. News 3 now in Madison, Wisconsin. Madison is not New York City. It's not LA where there's news happening all the time. A missing person, especially a husband and wife, that would be news. The Dean County Sheriff's Office shared this photo of Bart and Krista Helderson. Instead, spending today interviewing neighbors. There are too many unanswered questions. You know, cars go off the road. Um, things happen. You know, there's a storm or there's a crash or X, Y, Z. You just don't know. My boss was calling her or emailing her or texting her. I was doing the same. I was texting Bart and there was just never any response. I met Krista through work at Zimbrick Body Shop, and then I met her husband through her, obviously, and then, um, you know, they just did anything for anybody, like even people they didn't know. So I'm on the Krista side. We are related through my dad's side of the family, and we mostly saw each other in Wisconsin at our family cottage cabin during summers and family reunions. They both gave 100% to raising their boys. Mitchell was a little more outgoing, very easygoing. Uh, Chandler was a little more sensitive, a little quieter. Her whole goal for her being a mom was, and I'm quoting her, she said, I want my children to be the best men they can be. The biggest concern for me is just figuring out where they are. Police say the couple had planned to go to their cabin in Langley County. Our investigation began on July 7th when Chandler reported his parents missing. We knew exactly what Chandler had told us. We knew that his two parents were gone. Uh, they had left for the 4th of July weekend, supposedly to go to their cabin in northern Wisconsin. I've never been assigned to a case where a, a couple is gone. We ask even more questions to try to get a story and get a timeline of when did the Haldersons go missing? And everything was just happening so fast in those first couple of days. When we first got the email saying that Bart and Krista were missing, it didn't compute. Like, what do you mean they're missing? Like, they went up to the cabin and they didn't come back. And like, huh? Did you think possibly they'd been in a car accident and just hadn't been found? I thought about that, or I did think about the boat. Did something happen out on the lake? And all these stories are swirling around and not making any sense. And it's, you know, taking weirder and weirder turns. And we needed to search this area um, because of how remote it is and wooded it is and the access to water to see if we could find any evidence. No way I would have ever, ever guessed what was about to be revealed, never. Nobody saw this coming. Bart and Krista Halderson had everything a couple could want, a beautiful home in Windsor, Wisconsin, and two sons they adored, 24-year-old Mitchell, who worked in tech, and 23-year-old Chandler, a college student living at home. Chandler had big ambitions. He talked of getting his IT degree, of his promising internship at an insurance company, and was especially excited about a new job he landed at SpaceX, founded by one of the richest people in the world, Elon Musk. Everything seemed to be going well for the Haldersons. So on Friday morning, July 2nd, when Krista just didn't show up at the office, Dan Kroninger remembers becoming concerned. How unusual was it for, number one, for Krista not to show up for work, not to call, yeah. and just not show up? How unusual? Extremely unusual. 
Dan and Kristen not only worked together, they were close friends. So when she hadn't said anything to me, I was like, well, that's kind of weird. It wasn't something that she would ever do. Dan says he texted and called her several times, but got no response. Later that afternoon, he and his girlfriend drove over to the Halderson home. A neighbor's security camera shows them arriving. You know, knocked on the door, didn't hear anything, peered through the window. The only thing that seemed weird was there was a coffee table on its side. You looked through the door, it was kind of off to the right over by, they had a fireplace over there. Then Dan says he walked over to the garage window. I looked in, both cars were there. I was like, why are both cars here? And I was starting to go around the back of the house and then Chandler came out the side door and he came out in a towel saying, oh, I just got out of the shower. You know, hey, what's going on? I was like, oh, we're just looking for Bart and Krista. And he said, oh yeah, they went, had to go up north this morning for an uh, emergency up at the cabin. Dan says he was relieved to know that Bart and Krista were at the family cabin. Over the holiday weekend, he kept in touch with Chandler to see if he had heard from his mom and dad. But he said, yeah, they don't have very good service up there, so you kind of have to wait till the clouds clear before they get a message. On Sunday, July 4th, Dan says Chandler called him and said he was bored and needed something to do. So Dan invited him over to watch the fireworks and asked Chandler about his parents. He mentioned that he talked to them and they're going to be back Monday. All right, when he said that he had talked to them, mm -hmm. did he say he talked to both his parents or just his mom? What did he say? Do you remember? I don't think he was specific. I mean, I was asking about his mom because I knew she had a doctor's appointment coming up that she was really wanted to be at. I think it had been rescheduled before. But Krista didn't show up for work on Monday and again on Tuesday. By Wednesday, July 7th, when there was still no word, Dan knew something was wrong. And now she's missed her appointment. So now it's all out concern. Right. You know something's happened to her right. now. Right, right. Dan pushed Chandler to file a missing persons report that morning. Chandler Halderson walked into one of our precincts to report his parents missing. Detectives Sabrina Sims and Brian Shunk with the Dane County Sheriff's Office would lead the team to track down the missing couple. We had a lot of detectives assisting us with the, with the caseload. Their first stop, the Halderson home on Oak Spring Circle Drive. So when you first got there, who was home? It was just Chandler. We're inside the house with him and detectives are getting information outside and so we're either getting, you know, phone calls or text messages of, you know, hey, maybe ask about this. We're walking around the house with him. He's pointing out things at the house, things that were missing that his parents took when they traveled to the cabin. While deputies began interviewing neighbors and friends, Barbie Townsend, Krista's first cousin who lives in Southern California, knew only what she had seen on the news, that the Halderson's 23-year-old son Chandler had gone to the police telling them his parents were missing. What does that mean? What does missing mean? And that they had gone up to our cabin, family cottage, and didn't return. Bart and Krista had not mentioned to co-workers or their older son Mitchell that they had been planning to go to the cabin that weekend. But according to Chandler, another couple, who he didn't know, picked up his parents and drove them there. The cabin was a remote, rustic lakeside retreat and a treasured family heirloom. Barbie and Krista's grandparents built it in the 1940s. You know, you start to think of crazy things because our cabin's up in the woods. And so that's, we were worried that, are they being held hostage somewhere? Are they tied up somewhere? The day after Chandler reported them missing, his brother Mitchell and his fiance drove three hours up north to see if he could find any sign of his parents. Why would they not call? Why wouldn't there be a text or something? You know, your mind just starts to go down really murky trails because you're trying to figure out what's going on. Hi there. Hi there. Are you guys, um... The Halderson? You, okay, you are affiliated with them? Yes. The okay. police met Mitchell and his fiance at the car, cabin. But, uh, maybe we could just take a walk around and see. You would know the property probably better than we would. Prepared for the worst. Sheriff's office, anybody inside? Now it's your presence. Make yourself known.
When the Haldersons disappeared, it stunned everyone who knew them. Barbie Townsend said neither her cousin Krista nor her husband Bart would just leave on a whim. He was more structured. She was the more nurturing, you know, indulging mom. It was a wonderful combination. She worked as a customer service representative for an auto body shop and loved art projects. He was a managing director for an international accounting firm and enjoyed woodworking. They were 100% about the family. He was very involved in the scouting and all the things they did. The Haldersons were together on Father's Day in June 2021, less than a month before Bart disappeared. Mitchell is smiling, and Chandler, who had a mild concussion from a fall, is wearing a neck brace. Investigators, anxious to find out what had happened to Bart and Krista Halderson, asked deputies from the Langley County Sheriff's Office to help Mitchell, who brought along his fiance, search the family's cabin, a three-hour drive north of the family home. When they got inside, it was dark. There were no signs of Krista and Bart. They also checked a shed. The canoe was there. It was obvious no one had been to the cabin in a very long time. They're believed to be with another couple. Someone else, at least. OK. When Mitchell was with the police searching the family's cabin, Chandler was on his own hunt throughout the neighborhood. Here he is, seen on video doorbell cameras, going door to door, asking homeowners if they had seen or heard from his parents. It's kind of difficult to track him down. Adam Duxter, now with the CBS station WCCO in Minneapolis, worked in Madison, Wisconsin at the time. He immediately started calling his sources. So we're waiting to hear back from the sheriff's office. And um, my boss at the time, he um, was like, well, you can't just sit around. You know, you got to kind of go start shooting something. And so packed my gear in my car and drove out there to their street in Windsor. He knocked on the Halderson's front door. The missing couple's son, Chandler, answered. And so I'm like, if you'd be willing, I'd love to do a quick interview. And he was like, yeah, I'll do that. But I don't want you to film me. I don't want to be shown, but you can record my voice. So my last uh, message I got from them, they were going to White Lake for the 4th of July. And then that, their plan, or from to my knowledge, they were going to Langlade County to a cabin, uh, their cabin. At the time, I got this sense like he was in shock. And this is someone who's roughly my age, and so I'm thinking, like, yeah, if my parents just went missing, he probably hasn't slept. He's probably really nervous. Alex Gravat knew Chandler well. I was roommates with Chandler for a little while. I call him Chaz. The two friends shared an apartment from 2019 to 2020. We grew up together, and we played soccer together, did Cub Scouts together, um, and just hung out together. He was a great swimmer, so I know that the swim team really got along with him. Alex says his friend Chandler, who went by the name Chaz, could be a playful guy. He was a, a goon, a hooligan in a lot of senses. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, he would, so he would play pranks and he would make lots of jokes or poke fun at people. Alex described Chaz as popular with women. College student Catherine Mallander, known as Cat, was his longtime girlfriend. He was a relatively attractive guy. I mean, he, he looked good, he had great hair, he kept up on appearances. According to Alex, when they were roommates, Chaz often bragged to friends about hooking up with different women behind Kat's back. When she found out about it... She grilled him. She was like, are you seeing other people? And he just kept denying it. But Kat remained suspicious and began tracking her boyfriend on social media. Alex says Chaz became more secretive and moved back home with his parents. And now those parents were missing. Detective Shunk and Sims began follow-up interviews. At that point, you know, what do we really have? We don't know what we have. Then they got a tip they desperately needed. From the owner of a farm outside town, 
we received information from someone that, yes, Chandler had been out to my property over 4th of July weekend. The owner was a friend of Chandler's girlfriend, Kat. The owner said she was with the couple at her farm on July 4th. She told deputies she was surprised to see Chandler again the very next day. And this time, he was alone. And I saw him coming from the wood line. His car was parked, backed up to the field. So of course, right from that interview, um, well, we want to go search that property. As deputies began searching, detectives wanted to know why Chandler had never mentioned he had gone back to the farm by himself. Police picked up Chandler and took him to the station. What's going on? Detective yeah. Brian Shunk asked him to once again describe the last time he had seen his parents. It's Thursday morning. I wake up. What time is it? Six. Chandler said his dad, Bart, was at home working and that later he had dinner with both parents. That's where they told me while we were eating it they, they were going to go with their friends. And I was like, oh, cool. Um, well, and they asked, said they were going cabin. Yeah, the well, okay. we're going up north. While detectives questioned Chandler, deputies were out searching the farm and made a discovery that quickly changed the tone of the interview. Listen to me. This is the only chance you're going to have to tell us the truth. OK. OK. What we, listen, listen. I'm, I can't tell you what we know, but we know you're not telling us the truth. You need to tell the truth. There's, listen, listen. You need to tell the truth about what happened and just tell us why it happened. I'm not BSing you, OK? So can we do that? Okay, they're okay. Um, um, lawyer. Chandler's request for a lawyer ended that interview. Detective Sims remembers the moment she learned what deputies told her they had found near that field. You know, Brian and I were in the command post together, and I said, um, what did you say? You know, I just couldn't believe what I was hearing. They had discovered human remains. On Thursday, July 8th, 2021, in the village of Windsor, Wisconsin, the community struggled to make sense of the disturbing news. The remains of an adult male had been found on a farm 20 miles from Bart and Krista Halderson's home. At this point, it's very early in our investigation. Dane County Sheriff Calvin Barrett warned residents not to jump to conclusions. I don't want to make any uh, uncorroborated uh, speculations at this time. The gruesome discovery was made the day after Bart and Krista had been reported missing by their son. And it was something detectives Brian Shunk and Sabrina Sims had never encountered. The grass had been matted down and they followed it to a trail which led to um, the discovery of a male torso that was um, concealed with sticks and twigs. That was really the moment, right? It was huge. I think of other death investigations or homicide cases we've worked and I don't remember a time that I've worked a dismemberment case. And what other evidence was found out there? We found um, some cutting instruments, some um, that were hidden in a, an old oil drum, um, some scissors, um, pruning shears, uh, a broken bow saw. And it was all in the same wooded area where the Halderson son Chandler had been seen earlier in the week. Detective Sims had a pretty good idea who the victim was. Knowing in my gut that that um, was most likely Bart Halderson, and his son was seen in that area. Police turned their full attention to Chandler Halderson. He was now a person of interest and the prime suspect. While tests were being done to confirm the victim's identity, detectives arrested Chandler and charged him with lying to them. The arrest was based on him providing false information in regards to a missing person. 
Krista Holderson's cousin, Barbie Townsend. What did you think? They arrested him for giving false information about a missing person. That was the first day that I started to suspect foul play from their own son. I checked my phone and I saw that and it was that he had been arrested and it was pretty wild. Alex Cravat, his childhood friend, learned about it on social media. My eyes got wide. I, I kind of just sat there for a second reading it. My first thought was, if he's being arrested for giving misinformation to the police, I didn't think that there was really much of a chance that he wasn't involved somehow. But there's someone who had a hard time imagining Chandler was involved, his girlfriend, Kat. She spoke to police just before his arrest. You don't think he had anything to do with his mom and dad being unheard from? No. I just, no. That'd be crazy. But I just don't see him killing Mr. and Mrs. Holderson. Like, he had SpaceX. Like, why would he jeopardize something he, like, would dream of, you know? Yeah. Like, there's parents. For Christmas, they got him and his brother matching tool sets. Like, come on. Okay. He cooks dinner for them. They have root beer floats together. They play Mario Kart whenever his parents want to. But on Saturday, July 10th, 2021, the victim found in the woods was identified as Bart Halderson. It just changed everything. Like, that moment changed everything. Preliminary autopsy results would reveal Bart had been shot at least two times in the back. And there was still the troubling question. Where was Krista? Krista Halderson remains a missing person, and we continue to ask for citizen involvement. Krista's co-worker, Dan Cronier, ran through all the different possibilities. Did you, at that moment, wonder, like, maybe Krista was involved in this, too? It had definitely crossed my mind. I start to wonder, well, why is Chandler lying? Is he covering for himself, or is he covering for perhaps his mother? Is she involved? But the more investigators looked, it seemed the only person Chandler Halderson was covering for was himself. You know, he just lied to everybody. And in his lies, police started to believe they found a motive for murder. For months, he had been telling everyone, including his childhood friend, Alex Gravatt, that he was enrolled at Madison College during the 2021 spring semester. Did you have any idea he had flunked out? No. He didn't tell you? No. It was surprising. Detectives believe his parents had no idea he wasn't in school. They say when his parents questioned him about his transcripts, the computer savvy Chandler Halderson crafted a chain of emails that seemed to come from the college. Chandler creates people that work for Madison College and communicates via email with them. You know, Bart's on some of those as well, talking to who he believes is employees of the school. And do any of those people actually exist? No. In June 2021, Bart Halderson called Madison College pretending to be Chandler and got an answer he wasn't expecting. Sir, I don't see that you were admitted in any program. You said they were, you know, it's the IT degrees in there, right? No, those, those are just classes. You might have just took the classes, but not be in the program. Bart learned that not only had his son been lying about that IT degree, but there was no internship with an insurance company either. And remember that big job with SpaceX? Turns out that was just another elaborate lie. The delusional reality that he concocted, that is shocking to me. According to detectives, Bart was planning to meet at the college with his son on Thursday, July 1st. Around 2 p.m., Bart, who was working from home, sent his son this text, I'm ready whenever you are. That text is believed to be the last message Bart sent. Seven days later, Bart's remains were found. Investigators got a search warrant for the Halderson home. 
No weapon was found there, but a shell casing was discovered in the basement. And several areas inside the house tested positive for blood. Chandler, middle initial M, last name Halderson, age 23 of Windsor, is now being charged with first degree homicide, hiding a corpse and mutilating a corpse. On July 15, 2021, Chandler Halderson was formally charged with his father's murder. Chandler is currently being held in the Dane County Jail. I mean, I, I don't know what else to say. Like, how, how could you do that to your father? But where was his mother, Krista? Chandler Halderson had lawyered up and wasn't talking, but someone very close to him was. She had communicated with him that whole weekend. That loyal girlfriend, Catherine Mallander, had a potentially damning piece of evidence about her boyfriend on the social media app, Snapchat. She actually consented to a download of her phone. So that was a breakthrough. How do you feel about allowing people to track you on social media apps? Join the conversation now on social media. Chandler Halderson was charged with his father's murder, but his mother's whereabouts were still unknown. Lead detectives Sabrina Sims and Brian Shunk knew if Krista was alive, they needed to find her fast. At that point, we were hoping for the best. It was one of those things where we just needed to, to push on. Detectives turned to Halderson's girlfriend for help. She had given them permission to download information from her phone. Chandler had lied to her before and had cheated on her before. And so she, um, you know, would track his location. Kat had convinced Halderson to let her track his movements using Snapchat, the popular social media app, which allows users to send messages and share their location in real time. Um, and that was an agreement that, yes, you will have your locations on so I can see where you're going. Detectives were most intrigued by messages posted early on the morning of July 1st, the day Chandler Halderson and his father were supposed to meet with Madison College officials. Halderson, whose online name was Chazzle Dazzle, messaged Kat at 7.30 a.m. I hardly slept. I'm sorry, B. Why? I don't know, stuff hasn't really been going well for me lately, so I'm trying to plan for the next thing to expletive me over. B, it's gonna be okay. Yeah, I just had a great future planned and it's falling apart. According to detectives, the tone of those messages worried Kat. So two days later, when Kat checked Snapchat and noticed her boyfriend's avatar, that's hubby on her screen, indicated that he was nearly 25 miles from home, Kat saved the image to her phone. It was a Snapchat screenshot um, of Chandler, almost nine in the morning, um, out by the Wisconsin River. Detectives Sims and Shunk took us to that location on the river where they had hoped to find Krista. So where are we exactly? What would you call this area? It's the Wisconsin State Lower Riverway. And it's a familiar place to the former high school swimmer Chandler Halderson, close to his favorite swimming hole. This is him at the same place in a photo taken a year earlier, holding a large knife. Law enforcement throughout Dane County searched the wooded area. And how long was he here? 45 minutes, I believe. Yeah. Just keep in mind in July, but it's definitely far thicker than what you're seeing here now. Still no sign of Krista Halderson, but search teams refused to give up. Let's go hit one more area, and that was where they ended up discovering the remains. And what exactly did they find there? They ended up finding two legs um, cut into different sections. DNA tests confirmed it was Krista Halderson, the concerned son who had reported his mom and dad missing. 
was now charged with both of their murders. Krista's cousins were horrified. You couldn't write this. It just wasn't um, anything that you could possibly come up with in your head. How do you make sense of it? We don't. And that's the hard part. We don't have a why. In January of 2022, at the Dane County Courthouse, Chandler Halderson went on trial for the murder of his parents. All right, for the jury. He was also facing charges for lying to the police and for mutilating and hiding their bodies. Our job is to, over the course of the next couple of weeks, present evidence to show you the path of what we believe happened. Assistant District Attorney William Brown. That Chandler Halderson killed his parents, dismembered their bodies, and hid them around southern Wisconsin. Prosecutors laid out a motive. They say Chandler murdered his parents when his lies were about to be exposed, and that for months he had been trying to hide the truth from them. Among the evidence, those fake email accounts he created. No one uses a Gmail account as their official Madison College email? No. And his fictitious internship with an insurance company. I found no record of that person working for American Family. Investigators believe the murder weapon was a semi-automatic rifle that had been hidden in a barn at that farm where Bart's remains were discovered. Good afternoon, sir. Could you please state your name and then spell it out? Andrew Smith. And how do you spell it? Alpha, November, Delta, Romeo, Echo, Whiskey. The rifle came from this man, Andrew Smith, who testified that he was in the military when he met Halderson online. How did you meet Chandler Halderson? Playing video games while I was stationed in Germany, sir. Halderson had wanted a gun. Smith testified he had no idea what Halderson wanted to do with the weapon. And in June 2021, he gave him that semi-automatic rifle as a gift. Oh, I'm going to give it to someone who might actually appreciate this weapon and take care of it and nearly 480 rounds of ammunition. How did Chandler react when you gave him the gun? Oh, he was happy. What do you mean, but how do you know he was happy? Or how do you, how do you know that? Because he had a big smile on his face when I had given it to him as a gift. But the most anticipated witness in this trial... Good morning. ...would be Halderson's girlfriend. Did you verbally answer yes to the oath? Yes. ...who gave police that Snapchat screenshot. What is that? A screenshot of Chandler by the Wisconsin River. What do you make of the prosecution's case against Chandler Halderson? See more evidence at 48hours.com. Could you please state and spell your name for us? Uh, Catherine Mellander. For three hours, Kat Mallander sat on the stand, telling the jury about the young man she thought she knew, Chandler Halderson. Did you go on a lot of dates together? Uh, yeah, we would um, grab dinners, um, have movie dates, just sit at home and watch movies, go on walks quite often. Kat told the jury that she was working on July 1st when authorities believed the murders happened and didn't see her boyfriend in person that day. But you weren't with him? I was not with him. Did you know that Bart and Crystal Halderson had died? No. According to investigators, Halderson asked Kat to bring a few cleaning supplies to his home the following day. He told her he had stepped on some broken glass from the fireplace. She brought him a Swiffer mop and a bottle of hydrogen peroxide. Kat, did you have absolutely anything to do with cleaning anything up or their disappearance? No. Investigators say there's no evidence that Kat had any involvement in the murders. They believe Chandler Halderson acted alone. Prosecutors showed the jury police video from inside the Halderson home. These walkthrough videos will document the home as is. At first glance, it seemed neat and clean, but test results revealed what appeared to be blood. Is that all blood that it's reacting to? This could be blood that it's reacting to, yes. And that it appears that there's been some wiping or cleanup. 
For Barbie Townsend, the most disturbing part was when the jury was shown a view of the Halderson home from a neighbor's security camera. I was talking to one of my cousins. We said one of the images that is going to be seared in our minds is when they showed that video of the window. Flickering window from July 2nd. And it was the flickering glow from the fireplace for like hours. That is haunting, knowing what was happening. A forensic expert testified that more than 200 bone fragments were discovered in the fireplace. There's a white area in the middle of that burn. Based on my training experience, that appeared to be bone. Halderson's defense attorney, Catherine Dorrell, did not address the bone and blood evidence found in the home, but insisted that did not mean her client was the killer. Chandler Halderson did not murder his parents. He is not guilty of those crimes. She reminded the jury there were too many unanswered questions. What happened to the Haldersons? What happened in that Haldersons home? You just aren't going to know what happened. Chandler Halderson himself didn't testify, and his defense didn't call any witnesses. You have to go back and look at everything. Instead, attorney Crystal Vera closed the case and urged jury to find reasonable doubt. She admits Halderson told a lot of lies, but she argues there isn't enough direct evidence to tie him to the murders. I guarantee you that the 12 of you that are going to go back and deliberate are all going to have 12 different theories on what happened, and that's a problem. I'm asking you to find him not guilty a first-degree intentional homicide. Prosecutors had the final word. This is a first-degree intentional homicide. You cannot shoot someone in the back. You cannot chop them up. You cannot scatter their remains and come to any other conclusion. And there is only one person who did those things here, and that is Chandler Halders. And we're asking you to find him guilty. Thank you. It didn't take long for the jury to decide. Breaking news. In just about a little over two hours, a jury has reached a verdict in the Chandler Halderson case. We, the jury, find the defendant Chandler M. Halderson guilty of first degree intentional homicide as to Bard A. Halderson, guilty of providing false information about guilty of mutilating a corpse, guilty of first degree intentional homicide, of mutilating a corpse, guilty of hiding a corpse, guilty on all eight charges. I think it was just overwhelming from all the work that we put in on it. In March 2022, at his sentencing hearing... Good afternoon. Halderson, who had been silent during his trial, surprised everyone by indicating he finally had something to say. Mr. Halderson wishes to make a statement. Your Honor, I want to take this opportunity to state my intent to appeal my convictions. If there are any lawyers listening and willing to take on my appeal, take a moment to please reach out to me. It's not that I do not have feelings. It's that I was warned to not show them due to the scrutiny of this case. Thank you. What was your reaction when he had the chance to speak and all he did was ask for a lawyer to take an appeal? What was your reaction? I was actually disgusted. I just couldn't believe it. You're like, you can't even say I'm sorry. We are adjourned. Thank you. Halderson was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. When do you miss him? Oh, I think about him just about every day. <laughs> really? Yeah. We're building a pond in our backyard. You know, they would love to see that and love to be a part of it. Mitchell Halderson, Bart and Krista's oldest son, is now living with an unimaginable loss. Barbie shared a text and this photo that Krista sent to the family just three months before she died. Happy Easter. Yes, the boys and their women. 
Mitchell is still at Epic Systems and will turn 25 this year. Yikes! Chandler is currently interning with American Family Insurance as an IT administrator, but his other degree, sustainability management, has given him an edge. You see in her text how proud she was of her boys and how 100% completely believing Chandler. She can't help but wonder what would have happened if Halderson had just been honest with everyone. If he had just gone and thrown himself at the mercy of his parents, what do you think Chris and Bart would have done? They would have helped him. They definitely would have confronted him on it, but after the confrontation and the truth telling would have come the grace. How do we go forward? How do we help you? How do we get your life back on track? They would have helped him. It was deemed unsolvable prior to my involvement. Very small amount of DNA. Just a speck of a speck. Decades later, can it help this expert catch the killer? And I scream, today's your day, Rock. 48 Hours, Saturday on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Joey's missing. He's somewhere. He's gotta be somewhere. Hey, where's Joey? Have you heard from Joey? This isn't like him to not call me back. There's something really wrong. Let's go back to November 12, 2016. A bunch of people were going out to New York City. Joey would go into Manhattan a good amount. He would meet all of our friends there. He had hundreds of friends, hundreds of friends. Joey always had this positive outlook on life. When you were with him, you felt like you could fly. He was an athlete, loved sports. Bright future, smart kid. That night, we went to the Gilded Lily. The Gilded Lily is in the meatpacking district. It's a lounge. It has club-type music. It's kind of high-end. Everyone dresses up. Were you drinking? We were drinking. How would you describe Joey? He looked fine. He didn't look like he was even buzzed. 3.30 or so, the night was ending, so everyone exits. I remember Joey on my left, and these girls were looking at him a certain way, and he was looking back at me and just smiling, like, you know, that he was interested. I get approached on my right side by two guys, and they try to start some conversation with me. Joey's on my left, and they kind of form a group on that side. He jumped in a cab and went off with these two guys. Why do you think he did? Do you know? I just don't know, but I guarantee they're saying that they have a penthouse apartment. There's girls. This guy's dad's a jeweler. And that jeweler was the jeweler to the stars. Oprah! You're Oprah! talking about Oprah Winfrey. You're talking about Jennifer Lopez. He sold an engagement ring to Melania and Donald Trump. Saturday night came and went. I can't get in touch with him. Has your son ever gone a whole no. day without texting no. or calling no. you? No. I started getting phone calls from a bunch of our friends. Have you heard from Joey? Have you spoke to Joey? Joey's with you, right? They thought he was at my house. <sighs> what happened? So I went on Instagram. I went on Facebook. I called everyone on my phone. We go and we just start looking for him. Sunday. Monday. Tuesday. Wednesday. Everyone was still trying to get a clear-cut answer as to what was going on. Sources say 26-year-old Joseph Comunale came to this building early Sunday morning with friends. Why? Why were you there? Why did you meet them? Why did you go out that night? If you were invited to go to Sutton Place, you would want to go there. 
It's like its own private enclave that only money can penetrate. Kaminali's father reported him missing when he never came home. What's now going through your mind? The worst, the worst. <laughs> yeah. What do you think happened in apartment 4C? Something went terribly, terribly wrong. What happened in apartment 4C? Reported by Aaron Moriarty. I met Joey freshman year of college. We've been best friends ever since. Joey was one of my best friends. My best friend. Best friend. Everybody called him their best friend. But I was his best friend. Joey Cominelli's father, Pat, knew his 26-year-old son well. And at first, he wasn't worried when he couldn't reach him the morning after Joey went out with some friends on Saturday night, November 12, 2016. I know it sounds crazy, but in New York, things don't really start until late. It's not unheard of for kids to come home at 6 in the morning, and I figured he's sleeping. He was sick earlier in the day. Looking back, Joey's friends like Stephen Nasso will tell you that Joey never even intended to go out that Saturday night. I think he took a nap for like three hours. But then Joey's college buddy, Pritham Devakabarbu, a part-time promoter, texted and offered Joey VIP treatment at the Gilded Lily, a club then located in the chic meatpacking district in downtown Manhattan. I was working, so I'd be able to take care of everyone that came in. Did you ever worry about him? I worried about Joey because I loved him, but I knew that, you know, he always surrounded himself with good people. Elisa Libretto dated Joey Cominelli on and off, but mostly on, for five years. First at Hofstra University, and later when Joey became a sales associate at his father's security company, and Elisa became a teacher. He is like the rest of us. He wants to have fun, doesn't want any problems. But that particular Saturday, she and Joey, like a lot of longtime couples, were taking a break. We had a little bit of like a disagreement and I was like, you know what? I just need a little bit of space. Like I'll talk to him in the morning. So Joey headed into Manhattan from Stamford, Connecticut. We hop on the Mayor Parkway, shoot down in New York City. Joey was with Stephen Nasso, and they met up with a group of friends. It was always a good time to meet people, and that's why Joey and them came out to Guild that night. As the club was closing, you could see Joey and his friends exiting on surveillance video. It was early Sunday morning, and the crowd emptied onto the street. That's when Joey began talking to three women standing outside the club. Then, out of the blue, two men joined them. The men did not know the women, and they didn't know Joey and his friends either. There's six or seven million people in New York City, and they cross paths with us. At that point, Stephen borrowed Joey's phone and stepped away from the group. When Stephen turned back, Joey and the group were gone. And this new group that he had met, somebody said, hey, you want to go to a friend's apartment in Sutton Place and continue having some fun. Veteran New York crime reporter Murray Weiss covered the Joey Cominelli story when it first broke and is now working for 48 hours. So Joey went along, leaving his phone behind with his friend, thinking, I'll get it tomorrow, no big deal. They just jumped in a couple of cabs and off they went. Stephen got word that Joey had gone to a party uptown at someone's apartment, so he headed home with Joey's phone. Hours later on Sunday afternoon, back in Stephen's apartment, Joey's phone began ringing. It was his father. He said, hey, where's Joey? And I said, uh, he stayed in the city. And he was like, all right, well, something happened. Um, find him for me. So then I went to Joey's place, and he wasn't there. Did you talk to him every day? Yeah, every day. We'd talk about the Yankees and the Rangers and 
I'm so sorry, Pat. Stephen got in touch with Pritham, who tracked down the phone number of a guy named Larry who had been at the party. Larry told us that he doesn't know where Joey went. That's when the vast network of Joey's friends got to work, homing through social media, searching for any scrap of information. Friend Mike Mullen says they plugged Larry's phone number into Google and got a last name. And actually his Facebook popped up, Lawrence DeLeon. Is this the kid? Yeah, that's the kid we were with last night. Max was the one who really put everything in motion. Max Branchinelli was perhaps Joey's closest friend. He manages a restaurant, but when he heard Joey was missing, he turned himself into an online detective. Did you ever try to track down or retrace somebody's steps before using social media? No. You're in a panic and you're trying to find your, your friend. So show me where you started. So I went on Instagram here. And why Instagram? Why would you start there? Instagram, you can click on the location of the place and it will show people that posted a picture there from that place. Here's what Max did. He began using Instagram's locator function for the Gilded Lily, looking for users who had posted the previous night and that morning. He kept his eye out for Joey. As I was scrolling, I landed on this picture. And why did this catch your eye? This caught my eye because I happened to know him in the middle. By total coincidence, Max spotted a friend, Alvin. But that's not the only reason he stopped at this photo. I know the type of girls Joey chases, their dark features, and I just had a punch. I screenshotted the picture and I sent it to the group of the guys that were out at the club with him the night before. And what'd they say? They're like, yeah, it's that girl right there on the right. And I was like, wow. That woman had also gone to the Sutton Place party that night. Max called his friend Alvin, who had her phone number. So I then hit her up. Do you remember being with Joey last night? Like, we can't find him, he's missing. And she told me like, yeah, we were with him last night. She told him that when the party ended early that Sunday morning, Larry DeLeon and Joey walked her and her friends to an Uber. She told me they waved and he looked like he was going back inside with Larry. But when Max called Larry DeLeon, he said Joey did not go back inside the building. And he's like, he left with the girls. He left in the Uber with the girls. Those were two very different stories. At this point, I'm not sure who's lying to me. How does a 26-year-old man simply disappear? Joey Cominelli was part of a close-knit, loving family with a younger sister, Alexa, and parents, Pat and Lisa. He loved going to the city. He did it all the time. He loved it. You know, he'd go to Ranger games. He'd go to the Yankee games. He'd go to the Giant games. Pat Cominelli lives in a Tony part of Connecticut, but he's a Bronx kid at heart. He moved here, met his future wife, Lisa, and founded a successful security firm that he later sold for more than $400 million. But that meant nothing now that his only son was missing. How important is family to you, Pat? <laughs> yeah, family's important. That's, that's everything. Tell me about his relationship with his dad. I have never seen a person admire their father so much. I've never seen a father admire their son so much. They were inseparable. By Sunday evening, with Joey now missing about 10 hours, Pat phoned Larry DeLeon, who had been at the Sutton Place apartment with Joey. Larry says they walked the girls out to the car, and that's the last they saw. But then, DeLeon provided one small additional detail about Joey that, to Pat, seemed off. He said, the last I heard, he said he was going to get cigarettes. 
Did that make sense? Didn't make any sense, because if you talk to his, his friends, they'll all tell you that he never bought a pack of cigarettes in his life. Joey smokes cigarettes from time to time, but he never bought them. <laughs> that's, that's why it doesn't make any sense. Pat thought so, too. He decided to file a missing persons report. So I said, all right, let me go to the Stanford PD. By then, Pat had Larry DeLeon's phone number. The on-duty sergeant called DeLeon, who denied knowing where Joey was, but he did provide the names and numbers of two friends at the party, James Rackover and Max Gemma. DeLeon also provided the address, 418 East 59th Street in Manhattan, a building that calls itself the Grand Sutton. The Grand Sutton is a luxury condo in one of the wealthiest sections of New York City. And apartment 4C was home to 25-year-old James Rackover. You're not expecting an issue in Sutton Place. Sutton Place is a, is a beautiful place to live. No one would disagree. Over the years, the neighborhood's been home to a parade of celebrities, including Marilyn Monroe, Michael Jackson, and rock star Freddie Mercury. What could go wrong on the Upper East Side? And do you know anything about Larry DeLeon or James Rackover or Max Gemma at nothing. that point? You know nothing, nothing about them. But as the days passed, the police would find out a lot more about the three young men, all in their 20s, who partied that morning with Joey. The three young men in this story are young men of privilege. Larry DeLeon worked in real estate and came from a well-off New Jersey family that owned thoroughbred horses. Max Gemma was a computer software salesman whose father was once the mayor of Oceanport, New Jersey, and had been in business with Jared Kushner, President Trump's son-in-law. But no one appeared to live a more charmed life than James Rackover, who was living in Sutton Place. His father, Jeffrey, who had a much larger apartment in the same building on the 32nd floor, specialized in getting one-of-a-kind pieces of jewelry for the world's rich and beautiful. I grew up in the same town with Jeffrey Rackover. We grew up a block apart, and while we weren't close, our families knew each other. He not only cultivated becoming a jeweler to the stars, he wanted to be among them. He was friends with Jerry Jones, I mean, the owner of the Dallas Cowboys. He came to know Oprah. His apartment has photographs of himself with all these personalities. James enjoyed the good life. He was an aspiring model working in the insurance business, loved boxing, and even had a boxer named Gloves, of course. I think Joy had an opportunity to go to a fancy part of New York City, into a fancy apartment, and he went along. And there were those three young ladies along for the ride, Jenna Stissy, Katie Conroy, and Samantha Guardiola. But all that mattered to Pat was finding his son. He had already filed a missing persons report with the Stanford police, but also wanted to alert the New York City cops. So at 9 a.m. Monday morning, some 25 hours since anyone reported seeing Joey, Pat was at the 17th police precinct, where he told NYPD detective Yeoman Castro everything he knew. Detective Castro, I still remember saying, let's go to the building. And we jumped in the police car. When they arrived at the Grand Sutton, Detective Castro asked to view the building's surveillance video. And then he starts reviewing video. They asked me a couple times to come in and to identify if that was my son. So we did. At some point, you see your son. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Pat was overcome when he spotted son Joey and Larry DeLeon walking the three women out to the curb. But then what do you see? We see him come back into the building. So you see Larry DeLeon and your son right. walking back in the right. building. And right. what did that say to you? 
They're lying. There's a problem here. Remember, Larry DeLeon had said Joey did not go back inside the building. It was all too much for Pat. Detective Castro asked him to wait at the 17th police precinct. So as I went outside to make phone calls, the porter started to bring garbage out. And I ran back inside, and I said to the police, don't let the garbage go. Make sure you search all the bags. Just kind of had that sense that if these guys were lying, there could be something in the garbage. And sadly, he was right. Inside those bags, police discovered Joey's bloody pants, his shirt, and his driver's license. Also tossed in the trash, a special chain Joey always wore, given to him by his father. I said to myself, I don't think he walked out of the building alive. Fourteen hours after Joey Cominale and Larry DeLeon were seen on video walking those women to their Uber, surveillance cameras caught James Rackover taking his father's Mercedes-Benz for a drive. With the help of NYPD's network of cameras, detectives were able to track some of his movements. They quickly put in Rackover's Mercedes-Benz license plate, and bing, 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 it started showing up going down the FDR drive. The car went south around southern Manhattan. It then made a turn into the Holland Tunnel, but led out to New Jersey. But detectives could not pinpoint precisely where the car eventually stopped. They needed a break, and they soon got it from Larry DeLeon. He agreed to meet with them, and they sensed that there was something that he wanted to say. And so the detective said to him, you know, what do you want to tell us? We have a missing boy here. His family, you know, wants to know what happened to him. On Tuesday, DeLeon began talking. The party at the apartment in the wee early hours of Sunday morning had been lively, he said. One of the women videotaped some of it on her phone. There was cocaine and plenty of drinking. DeLeon and Rackover even competed to see who could give the best lap dance. But by 6.45 a.m., the women left in that Uber. And that's when cameras captured DeLeon and Joey walking back into the building and up to apartment 4C, where DeLeon says a fatal argument erupted. Larry DeLeon tells the police he has an exchange of words with Joey Communale that Joey says something like, James got the cocaine, you know, I got the cigarettes. What have you brought to the table? He kind of pounded his hand on a table. And Larry DeLeon admitted to the police that he just flew into a rage and slammed Joey, knocked him down, and hit him a few times. DeLeon says that when he began punching Joey, his friend Max Gemma was asleep on the couch. Then, DeLeon says, rack over, a boxing fan who took pride in his chiseled physique jumped right in. And according to Larry, James starts also beating the crap out of Joey, who's now defenseless and gurgling because he can't hardly breathe. Communale lawyer Bob Abrams has heard DeLeon's confession. He claims that after he had beaten a defenseless Joey and almost killed him, Max woke up. They got so very nervous because Racco was now beating the crap out of Joey that they would do anything Rackover said. And this is really difficult for me to talk about because what they did and how they did it is just so horrific. DeLeon says he told Gemma to leave the room, and that's when DeLeon says Rackover began stabbing Joey. The stabbing ended Joey's life. DeLeon says Gemma left the apartment and had no involvement in the murder. He says Rackover then dragged Joey's lifeless body into the bathroom. He tries to dismember him with a serrated knife. 
Dismembering somebody is not an easy thing to do. And Rackover was not able to do it. While they plotted their next move, they began a frenzied cleanup of the apartment, mopping up Joey's blood with bleach and paper towels, all the while fielding calls from Joey's friends and his father. You're talking to Larry DeLeon, and your son's still in the apartment. And they act like there's nothing wrong. Yeah. Incredibly, evidence shows that Rackover and DeLeon took time out to eat, placing a delivery order. Then, as shown on building surveillance cameras, they explored the basement looking, police say, for a way to get Joey's body out of the Grand Sutton without being seen. Then, they had another idea. What they do next is totally insane. As darkness settled on the city, DeLeon claimed he moved Joey's body, now wrapped in a comforter, to the ledge of Rackover's fourth floor window, while Rackover moved the Mercedes-Benz into position on East 59th Street. When Rackover gave him the class sign, DeLeon pushed the body uh, out of the window, four floors. And nobody saw it? We're, we're talking about a upscale apartment, midtown Manhattan, and nobody saw it? The Grand Sutton faces the Queensboro Bridge in Manhattan, and it was dark. It fell into an area where there may have been some bushes and concrete. And then when nobody was looking, after De Leon came back down, they stuffed the body into the trunk of the car, and then they drove off. Larry had told them that they had driven the body down to Oceanport, New Jersey, and that they had deposited him in a wooded area behind a florist shop. It was an area that De Leon was very familiar with. He grew up in Oceanport, a Jersey Shore town some 60 miles from Manhattan. He admits to helping take the body and to participate in digging, I don't want to call it a grave because it's not a grave, a hole, and then dumping Joey's body in a hole. But right before they were going to cover up the hole, Rackover took gasoline and started to pour it over Joey's body and in fact did light Joey's body on fire. After DeLeon's confession, police raced out to Oceanport and discovered Joey's burned body in a field behind the florist shop, exactly where DeLeon had said it would be. Two hours later, Sergeant Yoma and Castro arrived at Pat Cominelli's home in Stamford. You heard a car door close? I popped up, and I saw Detective uh, Castro. I already knew. Yeah, that was it. James Rackover and Larry DeLeon were arrested and charged with second-degree murder. What happened early Sunday morning? Did you do it? Did you kill him? Did you stab him? Max Gemma, who remembered DeLeon insists had nothing to do with Joey's death, was arrested later, but he was not charged with murder. He was charged with hindering prosecution and tampering with physical evidence. Gemma was granted bail. All three men pleaded not guilty, even Larry DeLeon. He challenged his confession, saying police had ignored him when he informed them he had a lawyer. But the biggest shock was yet to come when it was revealed that James Rackover, who seemed to live such a charmed life, was not who he claimed to be. James Rackover wasn't really James Rackover, was it? No. And it just seemed like there was always more to learn about James. 
or terrible things. To the outside world, James Rackover was a wealthy young heir and would-be model living in the lap of luxury on Sutton Place. But the man that Larry DeLeon claims is the ringleader in Joseph Cominale's vicious murder is not at all what he appears to be. James Rackover was not his real name. Detectives discovered James Rackover was not the son of celebrity jeweler Jeffrey Rackover. Police say James Rackover is also this man, James Bowden from Broward County. He's an ex-con from Florida, a world away from the understated wealth of Sutton Place. And James Bowden has a rap sheet dating back to his teens. He spent nearly a year and a half in prison for second degree burglary. Three months after his release, in September 2013, after moving to New York, he reportedly met Jeffrey Rackover at a gym. They were both working out and they kind of hit it off. Surprisingly, the multimillionaire bachelor, then in his mid 50s, soon invited the 22-year-old James to live with him in his lavish Grand Sutton apartment on the 32nd floor. And if anyone asked why the two were suddenly living together, Jeffrey explained it this way. Jeffrey Rackover told his closest friends and relatives that one day there was a knock on his door and a young man was standing at the door and said, you don't know me, but I'm your son. Jeffrey even took the extraordinary step of allowing James to change his last name to Rackover. James claimed he was Jeffrey's biological son. These are the documents for name change. They put this in a legal document. James Rackover said Jeffrey Rackover is his biological father. He lied in this document, didn't he? James lied in that document, and Jeffrey Rackover confirmed the information Communale family attorney Bob Abrams says it was all an act. They're not related. They're not related. Abrams alleges there was a sexual relationship between the two, but Jeffrey's lawyer categorically denies it. What's more, James's defense attorneys, Rob Caliendo and Maurice Sirkar, say they've only seen a father-son relationship. Jeffrey Rackover provided structure in the life of this young man. Jeffrey paid for James's education and helped him find a job. He even paid James's nearly $4,000 a month rent when in early 2016, James moved into apartment 4C at the Grand Sutton. After James was arrested for Joey Cominelli's murder, Jeffrey paid, at least initially, for James's defense attorney. What does James Rackover face if he's convicted of all charges? He faces spending the rest of his life in jail. Charged with second degree murder and other crimes, James is set to stand trial first, before Larry DeLeon and Max Gemma. Sirkars has a unique strategy. He says James is guilty of covering up a murder, but not of committing one. You were asking this jury to separate the murder from other pretty terrible acts, trying to cut up the body, getting rid of the body, burying the body, burning the body. It is tough, but, but they are separate things. They say it was Larry DeLeon who killed Joey. In October 2018, two years after Joey's murder, James Rackover's trial began. Opening statements today in the murder trial of James Rackover. But Jeffrey, James's biggest supporter and surrogate father, did not appear in the courtroom. It was a much different scene for Joey, whose family and friends packed the courtroom every day. What's been the worst part? Every day. Pat was the first witness, and his emotional testimony quieted the courtroom. I know it affected the jury. It affects the jury in any murder case. Prosecutors painted James Rackover as a monstrously callous killer, playing this phone call recorded in jail, where James brags to a friend. I don't know if you've been following, but I start trial in September, so I'm looking at being home around October-ish. My breath's going to be up there, bro. Like, my weight's going to oh, be yes. up when I hit the streets. They're going to be like, yo, this kid just beat this 
Rocky and he's home? Oh, my God. Yeah, see? Prosecutors called to the stand women who had attended that party, Ben Astissi and Katie Conroy. But parts of their testimony helped the defense. Katie in particular said DeLeon was the one brandishing a knife. He was using it to do coke off of. The women uh, painted a picture of him being pretty quick to use this knife for any variety of tasks. James's defense lawyers also point out that he had nothing to gain but everything to lose by killing Joey. James knew that if Jeffrey ever found out that a dead body had been discovered in his apartment, that was the end of their relationship. And that had to be factored into account as well when you consider why James felt so compelled to get that body out of the apartment. After more than a week of testimony, Prosecutors had a strong case proving the cover-up, but there was nothing that directly pointed to James Rackover as Joey's killer. They seemed to need something or someone more. And sure enough, they announced that they had a star witness who was going to take the stand. Prosecutors hoped to seal James Rackover's conviction by unleashing an 11th hour witness, Louis Ruggiero, a close friend of James Rackover. The new witness turned out to be the troubled son of a very, very popular New York television morning anchor woman named Rosanna Scotto. Popular and well-connected. Good day, New York. I'm Rosanna Scotto. Rosanna Scotto is as hometown as New York gets and her 24-year-old son told the court that he met James because of his mother's friendship with jeweler Jeffrey Rackover. The day after Joey Cominelli's murder, Ruggiero said he was working out at the gym when James called him, desperate to talk. Lewis testified that James looked strung out, he had bags under his eyes, and he said that James told him, I've done something awful. There was a kid in the apartment. Larence de Leon got into a fight with him, kind of knocked him out. And then James says, I got my own licks in there. And I didn't want a dead body in my apartment. So I slit his throat. We then put him in a comforter, threw him out the window, drove him 60 miles, and buried him in a grave. And then he adds, don't worry about it because I bleach clean the entire apartment and nobody will know about it. Ruggiero testified he thought James was just making a sick joke. But the reaction in the courtroom was very different. Gasps came out of half of the room that was filled with Joey's family and friends. You could see the jurors actually recoil when he used the word, I slit his throat. It was a stunning moment because Ruggiero was the first witness who directly implicated James Rackover in Joey Cominelli's murder. The testimony by Mr. Ruggiero was very damaging. But defense attorney Maurice Sirkars maintains that Ruggiero's testimony was riddled with factual errors. Ruggiero testified that my client slit his throat. And Joseph Cominelli did not have his throat slit. Sirkar stuck to his defense that Rackover is guilty of the cover-up, but not the murder. On cross-examination, the defense attacked Ruggiero. He had a lot of issues. Attorney Robert Caliendo. In the fall of 2016, he was in the throes of as bad a drug problem as you could have. Ruggiero admitted on the stand that he had been spending $1,200 a day on marijuana, Oxycontin, Xanax, and cocaine. He never called police to tell them about James's confession. There were a number of reasons to think that Mr. Ruggiero might not be the person you want to hang the hat of a murder conviction on. The prosecution rested soon after Ruggiero's damaging testimony. The defense then presented only one piece of evidence, the ring reportedly worn by Larry DeLeon when the fight broke out. And why is that ring so important? The ring had a sizable dent in it. And if you conclude that 
he hit Joseph so hard that he dented it, that certainly uh, is a fact that we would want the jury to consider, and it certainly speaks to who might have committed murder and who might not have. In his closing argument, Sirkars had one last surprise. He showed jurors four minutes of video where James could be seen in a building elevator, and then in Jeffrey Rackover's bedroom where Jeffrey is sleeping. Sirkars argued that in those four minutes, when James was not in apartment 4C, DeLeon alone killed Joey. Four minutes is plenty of time. But prosecutors have a different theory, that James was looking for cocaine in Jeffrey's bedroom, didn't find any, and the fight broke out when he returned to apartment 4C empty-handed. After 10 days of witness testimony and evidence, the jury got the case. Just got to get justice. That's really it. Now it's a waiting game. On Friday, November 2nd, 2018, after nearly five hours of deliberations, the jury announced it had reached a verdict. The former James Bowden of Florida, now James Rackover from New York, was convicted on all counts for the murder of Joey Cominale. The verdict was greeted with relief and tears. I want to thank the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. I couldn't be more proud of the NYPD and all of Joey's friends and everybody else who supported us over the last two years. I can't wait to get these other two sons of bitches to go down That's just right. like this ass no. part of my language. This picture is me and Joey in Manhattan. Those who knew Joey best, like girlfriend Alyssa Libretto. This is actually one of my favorite pictures. It just shows how much I love him. Are left with their memories. I definitely thought I was going to marry him one day, honestly. Um, he was just a beautiful person inside and out. And I, my life without him has been crazy. Joey's mother, Lisa, can barely speak about her only son. So this was our last family photo together. What do you think when you take a look at Joey? Oh, just miss him every day. As a way of remembering Joey, some of his friends got tattoos with the number nine which is the number Joey always wore when he played sports. I do have one. But of course, Pat Cominale just had to get the most elaborate tattoo. Can you see? So your son's always gonna be with you. Yeah. I said, I don't want him. you better make sure it looks just like him. And it does. Honestly, I never saw the kid cry. <laughs> never one time. It's ironic. I'm making up for it. He was a special kid. He really was. time I seen her, she would be texting or Facebooking, and she was constantly on her phone. I'm Nicole Lovell, and I, I've been nominated for the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. 
She's a happy-go-lucky kid. Oh, yes! She smiled and she sang all the time. Tonight, the search intensifies for a missing teen from Blacksburg. Take a good look. This is Nicole Lovell. She's 13 and was last seen in the Lantern Ridge area of Blacksburg between midnight and 7 Wednesday morning. Her father posted this message to Facebook. Nicole, honey, if you see this, if you're out there, you can come to me. I'm not mad at you. I'm worried about you. Police are looking into whether an app popular with teens was used to lure the girl. That night, I was going to knock on the wall and tell her to come in and sleep with me like she usually does. And I didn't do it. It's with a heavy heart that I have to announce that we've located the remains of 13-year-old Nicole Madison Lovell. 100 Seacom, en route, 89 West, Snowbird Curve. So where was Nicole Lovell's body? Nicole was, from what we understand, in the trunk of the car, and they move her right over here, got close to the edge and just. A very preliminary determination of the cause of death is stabbing. I went to high school with David Eisenhower. Everything he did, he worked hard at, and he wanted to be the best at. Investigators have said the 18-year-old college athlete and engineering student knew the little girl and, quote, used the relationship to his advantage to abduct her. At 12.39 a.m., just past midnight, Nicole sends her last electronic message to Dr. Tombstone. David Eisenhower's kick account username. I don't want to go to jail. I didn't do anything wrong. The second Virginia Tech student, Natalie Keepers, has also been charged. Natalie Keepers was an extremely smart person. She was very academically driven. She had connections to NASA. They stop at the Walmart. They buy cleaning supplies, gloves, wipes, bleach. The defendant purchased a garden shovel. I'm so sorry. I wish I could have stopped. <laughs> I trust that the courts will do what they feel is just. This is really scary. I don't think anyone ever expected any of our classmates to become a alleged murderer. It's no longer a situation where you worry about your child meeting a stranger in the park. You really need to worry about the stranger your child's meeting on the phone that you gave them for Christmas. This is the new crime of our time. Hours, killer app reported by Peter Van Sant continues in 90 seconds. Every morning, I come out here, sit with her for an hour. It's just been a nightmare. I still hope that she would come around the corner when she gets off the bus, or she'll come out of her room. The nightmare for Nicole Lovell's mother, Tammy Weeks, began on the morning of January 27th, 2016. I pushed the door open and the nightstand was up against the door. Sometime in the middle of the night, the 13-year-old had climbed out of her bedroom window, taking along her phone 
and her favorite blue cartoon blanket. Did you call her cell phone? Oh, yeah, a bunch of times. And what would happen? It goes straight to voicemail. I text message her. Everybody was calling her, texting her. Tammy called police and began scouring the area. Before long, a neighborhood mother gave her some chilling news. Nicole had been playing with her daughters and said that Nicole was said she was going out on a date. Like millions of teens, Nicole spent a lot of her social time online. So Tammy feared she might have left to see someone she'd met on the internet. You must be a bit panicked at this point. Yeah. The FBI has now joined regional and state law enforcement in the search. This afternoon, they canvassed her neighborhood. Nicole's disappearance also sent shockwaves through her hometown, Blacksburg, Virginia. More than 1,200 searchers are on a mission to find the 13-year-old. Volunteers even brought this infrared drone. I know she wouldn't go nowhere for that many hours without her medicine. Nicole was born with a damaged liver and needed a transplant before her first birthday. Now a teenager, she still needed her anti-rejection medication every day to survive. Her illness and surgical treatment had left Nicole with scars on her stomach and neck. Tammy says Nicole had emotional scars as well. So she was being bullied? Yeah, she did. She hated going to school. She would always make me write her a note for Jim because they would pick on her about her scar. Nicole's social media posts reveal a sadly typical teenage story. So lonely, she had suicidal thoughts, longing for love, and convinced nobody cared for her. Tammy says Nicole not only had trouble fitting in, she also had a difficult relationship with her father, David Lovell. He did prison time on a drug charge, and he's had other problems with the law. She wanted his attention. She wanted his love. I have regrets that I wasn't there. I feel, you know, what did I do wrong? Why wasn't I there for her more often? He'd left Tammy before Nicole was born. The two were never married. When you would go to work, was there anyone supervising her? Yeah, my parents. Your parent, did they live at the house? Yes. So she never went unsupervised? No, no. But Nicole was leading an unsupervised life online through the social media apps on her smartphone. It's like a loaded gun. Good morning, Blake County. It's your district attorney, Pamela Casey. Alabama DA Pamela Casey is on a national crusade, warning people about the dangers of social media. Uh, if you pick up your child's phone and you don't know the password, uh, that's a problem. She began speaking out long before Nicole Lovell disappeared in Virginia, and her online safety videos have been seen by millions across the country. I could actually go live on Periscope and post updates to you guys. If I can do that live sitting in my office, then your child can do that live in their bedroom. Years ago, you had to worry about your kid getting snatched. Parents don't realize that essentially your kid can get snatched um, their life taken by somebody they need in their own bedroom. By late on the day Nicole Lovell vanished, her parents' hope was fading with the winter light. We love you, Nicole. We miss you. We want you home. I didn't sleep at all that night. I waited. But it would be three days before Nicole's parents had to face the horrifying news that her body had been found. Your whole world just comes totally down. Because <laughs> she was my everything. Coley had a passion for pandas. Music, dancing. <laughs> Nicole touched many people throughout her short life. Shock and sadness were everywhere, but investigators had gotten a big break, and it came from Nicole Lovell herself. She'd left behind virtual evidence of a real-life murder. 
Want to know what's really on your kid's phone? Our tips for safety are on our website at 48hours.com. Nicole's dad, David Lovell, says even before her body was found, investigators had found a solid lead, something she had handwritten on her bedroom wall. She wrote all her usernames and passwords to all her accounts. FBI computer forensics experts traced Nicole's account information and quickly established that she'd regularly used Kick, a popular chat app attractive to teens in part because they can communicate anonymously without their parents knowing. When you had her phone, did you ever click on the Kick app just to see what was inside? No, I just made her delete it, uninstall it. Do you believe she reinstalled it? Yeah. So the FBI puts in what they call an emergency disclosure request to Kick. They want to see Nicole's personal account, and they make a startling discovery. It turns out that in the last two days of her life, she'd been messaging with a person who had a chilling username, Dr. Tombstone. Using an IP address provided by Kick, investigators traced the Dr. Tombstone screen name to this young man, David Eisenhower, 18, a freshman engineering student at Virginia Tech. I will personally not stop until I reach my peak performance. Track and field champion from Maryland. David Eisenhower seemed the last person in the world capable of killing a 13-year-old girl. He'd been a high school track star. Former classmate Dorothy Callahan says his brains and charisma were as strong as his strides. He was a very celebrated student. He always had straight A's, and he was sort of cocky, and he was like, yeah, I'm David Eisenhower. I was just on the local news. I'm a big deal. Three days after Nicole went missing, Eisenhower was picked up by police at his dorm and taken in for questioning. His roommate, Jeremy Bazdeo, walked in on the startling aftermath. I went to my room, and I saw the door open. I got turned around by the Virginia State Police and the FBI. And what did they say? They said, don't worry, it's not about you. It's about your roommate. Bazdeo told 48 Hours that Eisenhower's behavior the night Nicole Lovell vanished was really odd. And he put on boots, but it wasn't raining that hard for boots. But, you know, I just let it go. And then he came back at 2 in the morning. And did you ever see a knife in the room? Yes. He usually leaves it on his desk. Was it on his desk when the cops showed up? No, they couldn't find it. Eisenhower soon admitted to police he talked to Nicole outside her house that night. He was arrested and charged with abduction. Eisenhower's statements led them to another young woman, Natalie Keepers. She was brought in for questioning too. Finding a job in this economy has gotten to be extremely important. What did 19-year-old Natalie Keepers know about what happened to Nicole? Keepers another Virginia Tech freshman, and another unlikely person of interest. Mark Jenkins used to be her boyfriend. She wanted to study engineering and be like her father, who worked for uh, NASA. Investigators strongly suspected Natalie was involved. She, too, was arrested. 18-year-old Eisenhower, a Virginia Tech freshman engineering major. And his friend Natalie Keepers. With two people in custody, police made a grisly discovery. Nicole's nude body was located 90 miles away in North Carolina, says Surrey County Sheriff Graham Atkinson. What kind of wounds were on her body? She was stabbed and her throat was cut. And then the thoughts turned to who were the animals that could have done something like this to her. Sometimes it's usually the people we least expect. DA Pamela Casey says David Eisenhower may represent a new kind of predator. They could be your next door neighbor. They can stay behind their phone and hide behind their phone and just like your child is doing. Casey says criminals often use apps like Kick. Why? Because it's where kids hang out online. In fact, Kick, a Canadian company, claims that millions of American teens use their app every month. 
With David Eisenhower behind bars, it wasn't Kick, but an online gaming site that led investigators to this man's door, Bryce Dustin. I know, it almost felt like he was like a little brother. It was on this gaming site that Bryce first chatted with Eisenhower. And though they never met in person, they began a six-year-long internet friendship. David you know, kept coming back to me for advice on everything. What kind of problems would he ask you advice about? Um, girls was a big one. Dustin told us he remembers Eisenhower talking about a problem he had with one girl in particular, a girl Dustin now believes was Nicole. He told me that he found out she was underage and that she wanted to be with him and that she was going to expose him if he wasn't with her. He says Eisenhower was worried about being outed in a relationship with an underage girl. So he offered some big brother kind of advice. If she wants to be your girlfriend, you know, let her, but don't be the greatest boyfriend, you know? Just like, just don't text her, just ignore her, she'll go away. This family was about to have one of their daughters go away as well in the car of an online predator in Spokane, Washington. This guy wants to kidnap my daughter tonight. He's planning to kidnap my daughter tonight. Her last moments is what flashes through my mind. That's my nightmare. David Lovell wishes he had done better in protecting Nicole. If it can happen to my family, it can happen to anybody. I mean, flat out, anybody. It can happen to any family, including one here in Spokane, Washington, about 2,500 miles from Virginia. The parents here got a tip that their 15-year-old daughter was being targeted by a 30-year-old man. And what's worse, the two were planning to run away that very night. She was going to leave her iPad, hop in the car with a man she doesn't really even know. It was June 7th, 2013, when Detective Elise Robertson of the Spokane Police Department's Special Victims Unit got the kind of call cops all over the country have come to expect. A father was saying that his daughter was having an internet relationship with a 30-year-old man, and he had just found out. And then that's when everything broke loose. Until that moment, Brandy Sirachin and her husband, Brandon, seemed to have the quintessential American family. She teaching at a local church, he studying for a PhD in psychology. They'd been hands-on parents, raising their two sons, Joshua and Josiah, and two daughters, Ariel and Elizabeth. They shared a love of God, country, sports, and each other. My parents were pretty strict. Sometimes too strict, said Elizabeth, 18 at the time of our interview. I felt like my parents were holding me back from what the average kid gets to experience. And how much did your parents monitor your life? I would say that they thought that they were monitoring me. They didn't understand that they actually weren't monitoring me. They probably had no clue about kick in those dating sites. But her parents did become suspicious when Elizabeth, then 15, suddenly started acting strangely. She would be going to bed earlier than normal. Elizabeth seemed distracted, less interested in family activities, in church, even in friends. Her parents took her smartphone away and asked to see her social media accounts. She refused. And at that point, you're like, OK, yeah, something's really wrong here. They were stunned to learn just how wrong. It all started with a phone call from Elizabeth's best friend's mother, a call that turned their world upside down. Elizabeth is dating a 30-year-old, and he plans on coming down and getting her at 3 o'clock 
in the morning. That very day? Yeah, and we are like, what? Elizabeth was angry and evasive, but her parents finally got her passwords and soon discovered the truth. She had been communicating with a stranger, a 30-year-old Seattle area man named Jason. Jason Richards says, when I see you, baby, I am grabbing you, pulling you close to me, and holding you tightly. What does Elizabeth say? No kiss. And Jason says, baby, I'm going to kiss you deeply. This guy's evil. She's yeah. fooled. She's lured in. Initially, Elizabeth told Jason she was 18, but later admitted her real age, 15. The Sirachans were stunned to learn that the pair had already met in person and been intimate. They were even discussing leaving the country. The two had used apps, including Facebook and Kick. This is playing out in some ways like your own personal family horror film. Yeah. Yeah. The horror continued as the Sirachans realized that within hours, Jason would be driving the 280 miles from Seattle to Spokane to pick up their daughter. They locked Elizabeth in her room with no phone or internet access and called police. This guy wants to kidnap my daughter tonight. He's planning to kidnap my daughter tonight. Were your hands kind of tied? What do you do at that moment? You have a 15-year-old girl who's your only witness who's denying everything. Detective Robertson says that without hard evidence of an actual crime, police had to stay on the sidelines. So there's nothing they can do for you? There's absolutely nothing they can do for me. When you hear that, you feel totally helpless, and it's like, OK, well, what are you going to do now? What they did was hatch their own plan to turn the tables on the man who was about to lure their daughter away. This is my daughter, and nobody's going to mess with her, and nobody's going to get her, and I'm going to do what it takes. Jason had already messaged from the car. I needed to communicate with him to get him to our house. Gritting her teeth, Brandy went online, impersonating her own daughter. For seven hours, I sat there. And listen to him, oh baby, I can't wait to see you. I can't wait to get you in my arms. Lay in the same bed together, wake up in the morning. And for seven hours, I communicated back. Oh baby, I love you too, I can't wait. You're in the pit of your stomach, that must have It made you. me sick. Jason is getting ever closer to your house ever closer mm -hmm. to your daughter. My wife was up there, and she was on the iPad. She's communicating with him. Yes. Posing as your daughter. Exactly, yes. While Brandy kept the conversation with Jason going, in the alley behind the Sirachin's house, Brandon and his friends had set up a sting operation, like something out of an action movie. I am over here with my car and my friend Phil. We're getting updates from my wife on the phone. My friend Damon is on this side of the street. So the idea is like a pincer, right? You're, yes. gonna, you're gonna trap. It's like a bear trap that's yes. gonna close. Yes. Brandon's friend, Phil, brought his 12-gauge shotgun. He'd been trained in special forces and had no idea how Jason would react. Are you ready to use this? If I have to, yes. He pulls right in this drive right here. It was 3 a.m. in Spokane, Washington, but could just as easily been high noon. He comes all the way in here and about. As Brandon Sirachin and his team laid in wait, headlights appeared at one end of the alley. A 30-year-old man's sexual road trip to take a 15-year-old girl from her family was about to come to a shocking end. He pulls in. At this time, we go ahead and we call Damon down here, and Damon it just books it. And I'm pulling in here. 
Jason pulls in right there. Brendan's friend, Phil, quickly approached the vehicle, shotgun raised. I said, driver, put your hands on the steering wheel. Do not move or I will shoot you. A couple of times he moved his hands and I said, what part of do not move do you not understand? If Jason makes some sort of move, are you prepared to pull that trigger? If he exited the car abruptly, I would have shot him. They called the police, who arrived minutes later and arrested Jason. In his SUV, they found cell phones and a pair of hunting knives. He was caught, but it wasn't over. 90 minutes later, Jason comes face to face with Spokane detective Elise Robertson. So Jason, tell me a little bit. I work for Royal Cup Coffee. Detective Robertson learned Jason was actually Jason Richards, a 30-year-old divorced coffee distributor from the Seattle area. Like David Eisenhower and Natalie Keepers in the Lovell case, Jason Richards seemed nice and successful on the surface. Who is this guy? Jason is the guy next door. He tried to turn his crime into a love story. Pretty much fell for her very quickly. We said, I love you uh, pretty quickly, probably about a week and a half into really talking with each other. At first, Richards insisted he had no idea Elizabeth was only 15 until a policeman told him at the time of his arrest. He told, he told me that she wasn't 18. Okay. I responded, come again. And I'm like, she's now, I'm like, she's 18. He was lying. The whole time, he was lying. The whole time, over and over and over, lie, 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 lie. To see if her instincts were right. Would you give me a permission to look at your account? Detective Robertson asked to see Richard's Facebook page. There were literally hundreds of exchanges between him and Elizabeth. And I start looking at it and I realized, oh, he knew. He knew before he ever came over here, she was 15. You want to tell me the truth now? Well, I looked right at him and I said, so you're going to tell me the truth now? I fell in love with her and I didn't know what to do. And she told you that she was 15 and still in school? Eventually. Right. This is our first meeting spot. Elizabeth told her parents she was going jogging, but instead came to this parking lot. When you actually saw him face to face, what did you think? Holy crap, like I think it became a reality to me that it's not just somebody that I'm talking to over the internet. Elizabeth says Jason took her to a hotel, got down on one knee and proposed marriage. And then they got in bed. In the following weeks, he came to town again. On those visits, did you have sex with him each time? Uh, yeah, we did. For you, Jason is what? He's a sexual predator. I completely just f up my life. My life was destroyed. This hits you right now like a, like a punch across the face, right? It's just absolutely unbelievable. Richards pleaded guilty to child rape and communication with a minor for immoral purposes. His lawyer argued Richards has autism, which can be a mitigating factor for several crimes in Washington state. He got a light sentence, three years. These apps are apps that children are using. Take them all DA Pamela Casey says far too many internet predators are turning to apps like Kick, and their alleged crimes are making headlines across the U.S. A lot of stuff's happening without parents knowing. I don't think people would let a, you know, a 50-year-old felon into their house to hang out with their daughter, but that's exactly what they're doing online sometimes, and they don't know. Jason Richards served his sentence and was released in 2017 with restrictions, including a restraining order to keep him away from Elizabeth. The Syrachans say they wish the judge had given him as much as life in prison. It's just hard knowing he only got three years for everything, the pain that he caused me. It's, it's way more deserving than three years. And he's a danger. <laughs> it's not right. In Virginia, Nicole Lovell's mother says 
there is no punishment severe enough for David Eisenhower and Natalie Keepers. I want both of them to suffer. And she says they aren't the only ones who should have to answer for her daughter's murder. She blames Kick, too. They need to shut Kick down. It's just disgusting. Kick is reported to be a billion dollar company. Please welcome to the stage Ted Livingston from Kick. We caught up with the CEO at a tech conference in Brooklyn. That's him right there. Mr. Livingston, Peter Van hey. Sant, how are you? I'm good, how are you? With CBS News. So I wanted to ask a quick question. Sure. What personal responsibility do you have to make sure that children are safe who use the Kick app? Yeah, I think I have a huge responsibility. I'm sure you're familiar with Nicole Lovell, a 13-year-old girl in Virginia. What would you say to Nicole's parents? Like, when we heard about that case, like, that hit the office and hit me super hard. Like, like many social media companies, Kick posts an online guide for parents. And in a statement, told 48 Hours, the company cooperates with law enforcement. Designed it Ted Livingston it. claims his app is as safe as the competition. I think it's no different than Facebook or Snapchat and, or Instagram. You know, you have bad people going As a all. parent, I disagree. I can check my child's Facebook account and Twitter account. I friend them, but with Kick, I can't. Yeah, I think that's no different than Instagram. You have a private mode, you can have private messaging. All that exists there. That's true, but Kick's design is attracting millions of teens, in part because many believe it's parent-proof, the best app to keep their social lives secret. Kids are going to use a messenger. If we were to shut down Kick tomorrow, there will be 10 right behind it. And she's like, hey, do you want to message me on some app called Kick? And I was like, sure. Kick isn't on trial, but two once promising college students would soon be in the murder of Nicole Lovell. It was Nicole Lovell's digital footprint that led police to Virginia Tech freshman David Eisenhower. When they brought him in for questioning, he said he'd recently encountered the young girl on an anonymous chat app, and they moved over to Kick. And she's like, hey, do you want to message me on some app called Kick? And I was like, sure, whatever. Eisenhower said he met Nicole in person just once, the night she died, that he went to meet her, quickly saw how young she was, and left her alive. He told me to probably look like she was 11 years old, climbed out of the window, and I was like, oh, oh, uh, 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 not for me. And I'm sitting here just like thinking to myself, you gotta get out of here, you gotta get out of here, you gotta get out of here. But Nicole's Kick account told another story altogether, that they had been on Kick for months. They had met in person at least once before and most likely been intimate. With reason to worry, Eisenhower volunteered he just purchased a new snow shovel and offered up his friend. Would it help to mention I had someone else with me when I bought the shovel for snow purposes? Her name is uh, Natalie Keepers. And so police rounded up that second Virginia Tech student, Natalie Keepers. They recorded her telling a stunning tale, beginning the day before the murder. On Monday, there was a general idea that, okay, he has to get her into the car somehow. Keeper said Eisenhower feared Nicole was about to expose their relationship and asked for help brainstorming ways to kill her. On Tuesday, that's when the official plan started coming together. They bought the shovel, went out to dinner, and then Eisenhower dropped Keepers at her dorm. He had a prearranged date with Nicole. Then Keepers told the officers Eisenhower picked Nicole up, drove her into the woods, and stabbed her to death. The next day, he and Keepers went back to Walmart for cleaning supplies and disposed of the body together. Okay, where is she? 
Armed with this news, officers race to find Nicole's body. Eisenhower and keepers were arrested. For Nicole's family, a long wait was just beginning. Is there any doubt who is responsible for the death of your daughter? No. It took two years, but in February of 2018, Eisenhower went on trial for her murder. Finish it, please. Okay. Prosecutors described Nicole's final hours as she waited for her secret date. She gives her mom a kiss, and she tells her she's going to bed. Cole pushes her dresser in front of the door. She climbs out of the window into the snowy night. And into Eisenhower's waiting car. Nicole's mother described the horror of finding her daughter gone. When was the next time that you saw Nicole? In her coffin. Security footage showed Eisenhower and keepers buying the shovel. Photos revealed bloodstains and the bloody shovel found in Eisenhower's car. That is a receipt. And a Walmart employee read a list of items they purchased before discarding Nicole's body. Top job, basic bleach cleaner, great value disinfectant wipes, and two pairs of cleaning gloves. Eisenhower's lawyer said Natalie Keepers killed Nicole, and he said a bloody handprint on the shovel proves it. The palm print that made that bloody palm print on the shovel was not David Eisenhower. It was ruled out as being David Eisenhower. It was Natalie Keepers. You see the shovel. But on the fourth day of testimony, came a bombshell announcement. Guilty or not guilty? No contest. Facing a mountain of incriminating evidence, Eisenhower suddenly changed his plea from not guilty to no contest. Prosecutors read one of his last kick messages with Nicole into the court record. From the defendant, but I can't stress enough that you don't tell anyone about me because they will find a way to hurt you. From Nicole Lowell, who will hurt me? Who's they? Why are you scaring me? The judge accepted his revised plea and ruled Eisenhower guilty. But Nicole's family still had one more ordeal to sit through. In September 2018, Natalie Keepers went on trial as an accessory to murder. She had already pleaded guilty to helping Eisenhower conceal Nicole's body. Prosecutors told new jurors the same story, that David Eisenhower killed Nicole Lovell, but he had help from Natalie Keepers. Over several weeks, they planned out the murder. They considered shooting her, poisoning her, making it look like it was a suicide. Prosecutors played audio recordings of Keepers describing Eisenhower's messages to her on kick. He would say, off her, kill the bitch, um, kill her. Keepers said she knew it was wrong. Keeper's attorney called a neuropsychologist who examined Keeper's and diagnosed her with seven mental disorders, including borderline personality disorder and a disorder like schizophrenia. These people may look odd. Their sense of reality is off. Their ability to relate to others is off. Their interpersonal skills are off. The doctor said Keeper's mental state could have made her interview with the officers unreliable. Such a person would be highly easily influenced and gullible and would be easily led. And Keeper's lawyers say she was playing along with Eisenhower to keep his friendship and had no idea he would really kill Nicole. 
You will hear her actually describe that she thought it was a fantasy, something that wasn't real. I thought he was joking. I didn't think David could actually kill her. But the prosecutors disputed that notion and read Keeper's kick messages to Eisenhower after the murder, telling him he deserved a good night's sleep. She's proud. She's proud of what she and David Eisenhower did. It's almost like congratulating someone for getting through five finals in a week. You deserve it. Get some sleep. The jury took just over one hour to reach a verdict. We, the jury, unanimously found the defendant, Natalie Marie Keepers, guilty of being an accessory before the fact. Natalie Keepers was sentenced to 40 years in prison, and David Eisenhower was sentenced to 50 years in prison. Neither is eligible for parole. They both apologized to Nicole's family. I wish I could have stopped. <laughs> Nothing can ever undo what has been done, and for that, I am deeply, sincerely, and forever sorry. Even with guilty verdicts, the question of why may never be answered. The shell-shocked community of Blacksburg still doesn't understand how two intelligent college kids, with their lives in front of them, would take the life of a 13-year-old girl. I wish you would have done it to me instead of her. <laughs> I would trade places with her in a heartbeat. Because <laughs> she deserved to live. <laughs> And nothing's the same. Nicole Lovell's death is a dark reminder of how social media Ask Nicole Lovell. have profoundly changed society. For the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. I hope everybody learns from this. Hold their kids tight, because it can happen to you. Today, our children have a host of new ways to live and new ways to die as well. was the first female district judge to be on a criminal bench in Travis County. The decisions I make every day, someone's not going to leave happy. Travis County 911. Please hurry, this guy just went up to the car and shot my mom. And I protected my head with my arm and my hand. I can remember thinking, I'm going to die in front of my own son. She sent a lot of people to prison. We didn't know who did this. And it just shows you that you'd never know who it's going to be. Next. CBS News, original reporting.